Hi everyone. How's it going today? I hope you're all doing well and feeling good. It's always a pleasure to have you with me on my channel. As usual, I will discuss some topics that you might like. I understand that the quality of this video might not be the best, but I hope that the content is still understandable and informative. If you're interested in learning more, I also have a Telegram channel where I share various information that I can't post here. And make sure to subscribe to my backup YouTube channel in case of unforeseen events. So, without further ado, fasten your pants and let's get started. Examining the origins of a concept or practice can often provide valuable insight into its nature and function. This is certainly true when it comes to usury, a practice that has been condemned throughout recorded history for demanding greater repayment than what was borrowed. This practice, along with the practice of giving false measure, has been denounced by philosophers such as Aristotle and Plato, prophets in the Old Testament, early Christians, and even in the Islamic world, Muhammad, who condemned everything about usury. The modern-day bankers have taken this practice to a whole new level by lending money created from nothing, known as fiat money, and charging taxpayers interest. The value of fiat money depends solely on the confidence of those who use it, and it has no intrinsic value. In the past, objects such as cattle, iron, gold, silver, diamonds, and shells were used as money due to their intrinsic value. Money, whether tangible or a computer entry, is based on a social agreement or legislation to recognize value. This allows the object or computer entry to be accepted in exchange for commodities, products, goods and services, or to settle debts. Today, people use a mixture of traditional and newer forms of money and financial institutions to manage their money. This includes public and private currencies such as coins and paper notes, checks, and debit cards, as well as various means of storing money such as accounts, savings bonds, and certificates of investment. All of these various forms of money, and the institutions and markets that help people borrow, save, and invest, are part of the world's financial system. Before I continue the video, please give a like if you learned something. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell, so you won't miss any update. Finally, watch until the end to avoid any misunderstanding. Thank you. Money serves three primary functions. As a means of exchange, a unit of measurement, and a means of storing purchasing power for future use. Firstly, money simplifies our exchanges and acts as an intermediary in transactions. Without it, we would have to trade goods and services directly, which is known as bartering. Today, money is more of an IOU rather than a commodity like gold or silver. Secondly, as a unit of measurement, money allows us to compare the value of goods and services. It's the standard for pricing and buying or selling, as well as comparing costs, income, and profits over time. Money is the foundation of the accounting system that allows us to make economic decisions. Lastly, money allows us to accumulate savings over time and lend them to someone else, making it easier to make contracts promising to do something now for payment in the future. However, it's constantly losing value and is a moving target. In the past, each bank would issue its own money, but today, central banks issue the majority of banknotes. There are two types of money. Government-created, debt-free, interest-free notes, and private bank cyber accounts, created through debt and loans. Over 98% of money in the US and Canada is in the form of debt on which interest is paid to private banks. There are different measures of money in circulation, such as M1, M2, M2+, and M2++. The broadest measure includes all types of mutual funds and CSBs. The amount of money in circulation can have a significant impact on our economy, and it's important to understand the different measures of money when making financial decisions. Liquidity refers to the ability to meet contractual obligations, and money is the liquid asset par excellence. Fiat money, which is not backed by collateral, can lose its value over time due to inflation. 
money is created at the central bank and local bank levels when the borrower's promissory note is deposited as an asset in the bank's accounting system and the borrower's own note is used as the value to fund the loan by issuing a check to the borrower. Money in circulation is monetized debt or promises to pay. Banks can destroy or create money, and the power of private banks over money creation is virtually unlimited. The U.S. debt has grown to an astounding $31.5 trillion, and the Federal Reserve Central Bank is collecting interest on fiat money created out of nothing. Debt write-offs have no real capital effect on banks overall, but they can lead to bankruptcies and price deflation. The losers are always the employees, shareholders, taxpayers, and the masses, when public assets have to be sold off to the banking dynasties for a penny on the dollar. Money loses its value when it is created and put into circulation faster than the growth in productivity in the local economy. As we delve into the workings of the fractional reserve debt money system, we must acknowledge a critical component. The interest on bank-created debt. This interest ensures that the system cannot survive without continuous growth. You see, when banks create money to lend, they do not create any money to pay off the related interest. The only way to potentially pay off interest is through further borrowing for further production or the release of interest collected by the bank owners. If the private owners of central banks choose not to extend any more credit, there will be no money to service the interest payments, causing bankruptcies and foreclosures. These owners will then purchase the foreclosed properties for a fraction of their worth, just like they did during the Great Depression of 1929. They will continue to amass wealth while the masses sink deeper into debt or work for the bank owners. It's important to note that both the privately owned Fed banks and commercial banks create money from nothing, and their major owners are the same 300 families. These families include the 13 families, such as Astor, Bundy, Collins, DuPont, Freeman, Kennedy, Lee, Onassis, Rockefeller, Rothschild, Russell, Van Dyne, and Merovingian. Other families, like Reynolds, Disney, Krupp, and McDonald, are also interconnected with the main 13 bloodlines. These families, totaling about 300, control the show. You can learn more about these families in Fritz Springmeier's book, Bloodlines of Buddy. It's essential to understand the power dynamics at play in our financial system and the interconnectedness of those who hold the reins. Now, it's time for me to hear from you. What are your thoughts on this video? If you found it interesting or informative, please consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing it with your friends and family. Remember, the more people know about these important topics, the better. Before we wrap up, I want to extend a huge thank you to all the individuals who dedicated their time and energy to research and gather the information presented in this video. Their efforts are truly commendable and have helped shed light on important topics that affect us all. Make sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications to be notified when the next video is uploaded. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.